Hi, I'm Georgia. And I'm Renee, and welcome to Zen and Tech, our lifestyle podcast where we try to help you, I don't know, center your inner geek and you know, enjoy your connected life. How are you doing, Georgia? I'm doing good. How are you? I am doing excellently well, thank you. Is that a good answer? I, I, I don't know if I believe it, but I like it. I'm happy we got the podcast going. Yes, me too. So what are we talking about tonight? What's our subject? What's our topic? Tonight we're talking about the good, the bad, the ugly, about social networking. Now, when you say social networking, do you mean the traditional kind of social networking that everybody thinks, you know, obviously Facebook, maybe Twitter, or are you including things like Instagram, maybe stuff like WhatsApp? You know, how far are we going? We're going to go as far as into the rabbit hole that we can, uh, but we're going to start off with mainly the ones that most people use, and then we're going to take a look into what's coming and why are they popular, and um, why are they so expensive? Can we start off with just maybe why people, I understand that people are sociable creatures, people like to communicate. At one point in time, we told stories around the fireplace, then we figured out how to write things down, and then eventually press books, and then we created a telephone, but with a telephone, I had to call you, you had to call me, we both had to be available at the same time and have the same amount of time to talk, uh, which is different than letter writing, because you could write a letter and then send it in, uh, but then when computers came around, we got this, we got this ability to sort of text and then you know send ICQ back in the day, AIM, all these things where you could just blip little bits of text to each other and I think that's maybe how we started being digitally social. Yeah, and it almost seems like we're going all the way full circle. It kind of started off with um, discussing things, talking about it through word of mouth, then we wrote things down and kept it for other people to deal with it, then we were dealing with something that's really live and on the phone. Uh, then we were texting, and now we're kind of going back into videos and everything else. So media is definitely changing, and it's changing the way that we communicate with each other. So in the old days, I mean, you had to be in a village. You would literally just be you and your family, and you typically had very large families, and your village was an extended family. And then we all sort of urbanized, we industrialized, we got very busy working at our jobs. Uh, and now we have these sort of virtual environments where maybe we don't see our family, we barely talk to our coworkers, but we have these entire social circles that exist purely digitally. Plus the amount of time that it would take in between messages it used to be forever to send, uh, let's see if you were dealing with pony mail and then after that we were dealing with snail mail and uh, then we were dealing with you know phone calls and if you weren't there and then we had like a recorder that would be able to replay the messages and now it is almost instantaneous. You can send and receive a message and now you can do it through video so people are almost there though they are not. So what is that? So what is the basic need that this is fulfilling with us? Because you've talked on previous shows about the needs that we want to sort of—I don't mean like Maslow style—but <laughs> what does being social help us with? Why do we? Why are we social creatures? Well, we happen to like to feel connected, to feel a part of people, and that's what social media has allowed us to do. It actually allows us to be connected immediately with other people. Now the nice thing about social media is that say that you are homebound or you have a disability or there's an issue going on with your family or you're traveling really far away, you can still feel that sense of being connected and having a community even though there are miles or hundreds of miles in between you. So it allows people to really stay connected with others that they like and even if you are you know really really shy or you have social anxiety and it's difficult to do a face to face conversation through the anonymity of being able to text many people find that so much easier plus you can have your own little tiny pod which makes you feel good without that worry of being excluded so you know some people have like you know thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of Facebook friends probably most of them they do not actually know but it still makes you feel um, important you probably have like a hundred thousand Facebook friends Renee no, I, I only Facebook people. And we'll get to that later, but I have very few. Um, but, so the interesting thing is that you can be a real-world introvert but be highly social uh, digitally. You can, and that's wonderful in that it will feed that need for being part of a social group without having to go through that risk of person-to-person um, -person interconnections and dealing with 
Um, also, the, the, another cool thing actually about social media is that you can be anonymous. If you're worried about the way that you look, if you um, have some visual disformity that you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about people gawking and people um, commenting on it. It really is dependent on the power of your writing and your text to give your message through. So that's one of the nice things is that people get to know you for who you are, not for what you look at or how much many things you have unless of course you're playing like uh, World of Warcraft or something else. Where well that's the thing I mean, and, that's, and, and yes and no right because right. there's all different kinds of social networks. You have some where people can just use a screen ID and they're very anonymous and you have the kind like Facebook and Google Plus that want to insist that you use a real name because their primary purpose is identity not really uh, not anonymity but you also have things you can have a variety of circles for example you can have a completely different set of friends on Facebook than you have maybe on Xbox Live or have um, you know maybe on LinkedIn for your business contacts it's almost like I mean I, I remember a long time ago I, when I worked in Japanese companies and they would talk about context how you would act differently in front of your boss than you would act in front of your home than you would act in front of your friends um, and we all have that to a little bit, but you can really be an almost completely different person in each social network to the extent that they might even, you might have different names, different aliases, an entirely different sort of creation. A different sex. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you, you could be really, truly, almost whoever you would want to be, which is really good in some ways and really bad in some others. So let's sort of break it down. What are the differences between sort of an incredibly anonymous social network, uh, sort of like the old days with IM where you just gave yourself a screen name and chatted back and forth, compared to a Facebook or a Google Plus where they want your identity, um, some place that's private, that, that's pu that, that's sorry, some place that's supposed to be public but you can be private like Twitter, or some place that is you know private but kind of thrusts you public like Facebook. How do you navigate these incredibly complicated, convoluted waters? What's really different? Let's just go into the difference between anonymity and non-anonymity. So Perfect. if you are anonymous on any application, you can be as aggressive or as nice, be as rude or as sweet as you want to without any cost. And as we have seen, when you are fully anonymous, people can be exceptionally cruel and really lash out at other people. If they have anger issues, they can bring it out. If they're feeling depressed, they can deal with it. Or they could um, you know, give off whatever information they like without having to worry about it coming back to haunt them. So anonymity is in some ways really, really powerful because you can be as honest as you would like to without having to worry about it coming back to you. you it also breeds for people being really horribly cruel at times and that's the dangers of certain social medias especially if you are very sensitive is that you're like swimming in a sea with a whole bunch of sharks just waiting to take a piece of you and so people that trend to going into anonymous different social apps there's a reason for wanting to be anonymous there's that uh, very very famous penny arcade cartoon called the greater internet f wad theory where it posits that normal person plus anonymity plus internet equals words that I can't say on this podcast. Right, right, which are not being a nice person. Yeah, and what's interesting is that there seems to be these different criteria. For example, I know people who are incredibly resilient but incredibly offensive, who are incredibly resilient but incredibly polite, uh, are, not, are, are very fragile but polite, and also people who are incredibly uh, thin-skinned but incredibly offensive and dealing with those different dynamics is really interesting to watch on social networks. Yeah, it can be a lot of fun if you are looking at it from a few paces back. But if you're the one in the firestorm, it can be also really damaging to who you are because uh, though you would feel insulted, the person doesn't actually see you as a person per se and I think that that's what people forget is behind the screen there is a real person that has a whole bunch of real life issues that they're dealing with and you are, are damaging a real person it is not just a whole bunch of uh, letters and numbers formed together into one sort of shape. So let's break that down a little bit so you have um the, one of the problems is in text-based communications there's no emotion there's no body language and that's one of the primary ways we communicate right? It's about 80 to 90% of language is um, 
face-to-face -face reading body language, reading intonation, reading facial cues. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I don't like to do uh, therapy sessions over even Skype, uh, but I, I really don't like to do them over the telephone because I can't really read what's happening. And a lot of, you know, if someone's tensing up or not is kind of lost through there. So we ended up adding um, emojis so you could kind of give like a little winky face, you know, or a little happy face. But really they don't... Um, they, they don't really like give the true gist of an emotion and so like and a lot of people yeah plus a lot of people get into fights over text you just lose so much information you read it one way and unfortunately people will read whatever text they're reading dependent on their own moods feelings and wounds so if your wound is being abandoned and I say you know what catch you later um, I might have said in a really cute friendly way and you might be like yeah catch you later like I don't want to see you anymore and that's the way that you're gonna assume that I am saying it so we read things just dependent on our own issues well that's interesting too so there's two things I want to sort of unpack there one is communication is interesting because I form an idea in my head I struggle with the language to express it as closely as I can and I may or may not be successful you receive that message your language skills come into play uh, in how you kind of decrypt that message, because it really is kind of like encryption, how you decrypt it, and then the, your state of mind weighs into how you you digest or, or comprehend that communication. So almost every com conversation is kind of a broken telephone to begin with. It absolutely is. Even when you're dealing with face-to-face -face communications, most people will misread. I deal a lot with couples, and I will hear you know a husband say something that I think is really loving and meaningful, and the the wife or or vice versa, of course, will take it as something that was horribly cruel and callous. And so we're hearing the exact same conversation, reading the same intonations, and I take it one way, but because of the dynamics in the relationship, all of your own wounds and issues, you're reading it completely different. Now think about taking away all of the body language, mm -hmm. all of the intonations in your voice, your facial expressions, and take that away and now you're still reading it through all of your wounds, but now even more harshly. And then, so you have the other thing that you mentioned, which is this attempt to try to, uh, I don't know, emotionalize because of the name, there's emoticons, which was the first, you know, very crude uh, colon, dash, bracket to make a sideways smiley face. That got refined sort of into emoticons that we have now. Then there was emoji, which is the Japanese version, which, you know, might have a smiley face, but might also have a truck or a dancing girl or a smiling poo or a building. Um, and Never then you understood have, what that one meant, but okay. I I don't know either, but so but then you have take it a step further, and you have new social messaging networks. You know, Facebook Messages has adopted this, but things like Line, where they actually have stickers, and the stickers could be Hello Kitty or Garfield or something, but they're animated characters which are almost hyper emotional, but they're still static images. They can only portray one sort of uh, the impression of one feeling at a time. And we read them really improperly because, uh, you know, it's not just what they're doing, but the way that they go through it. So again, one person can look at something that's sarcastic and someone else can look at it as a cringe. And so a lot of information is lost in between it. So I could end up saying something that was horribly cruel and then try to put a little, like, smiley face to it after. And it, it just, they, there's such a disjoint in between the two that they don't work exceptionally well. So... Uh, getting back to the format, and, you know, there's that famous line, uh, the, the medium is the message, and you have things like SM, the traditional SMS was 160 characters, Twitter is 140 characters because of the SMS limit, um, Facebook you have both, you can post on a, pub, a semi-public wall, a wall that you and your friends and friends of your friends maybe can see, but you can also send private messages, IM like WhatsApp or BBM, you can have groups, but you can also have direct personal messages, and all of these sort of exist in different contexts. They do, and they, they have certain purposes. I actually really enjoy texting because it's quick, it's efficient, it's easy, and you know all of these spaces in between a conversation are kind of cut away because you get one message immediately that is giving a thought. So for speed and efficiency, uh, something like just the regular SMS works really, really well, but if you're dealing with something that is very heartfelt or if you're having a fight with someone, uh, you know, choose the phone over SMS and then choose in person over the phone. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't Facebook fight. Uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, celebrities Facebook fighting online. Like, don't, don't do that. It's, it's something that's there. It's there forever and they will remember it. You should not, and fighting over email is even worse. Don't, just don't do that. It's, it's so, so many levels of wrong. 
Is it worth breaking down sort of some of the pros and cons of social networking and then sort of maybe which ones fit different kinds of, or which ones are maybe better for certain kinds of people? I think that's great. Like, you would probably be great to go through what you think each social messaging is good and for what type of person ends up dealing with it. Like, you, you know, want to start with that? Yeah, sure. Let's go through it. And so, I'll go through a little bit of the good and the bad with each of them and what kind of are the costs to using, um, yeah, social networking. So I guess let's start, if you want, if you do ascribe to the theory that social networking evolved from and maybe is evolving back into instant messaging, we sort of have the beginning, we have SMS, and SMS, you know, some people have called it the most profitable le legal business ever designed by man because they were charging us 10 20 70 dollar for things that were free for them, but you know, that aside, I'll put my rage aside on that for a moment, it was originally short bits of text that were 160 characters long. Now it's theoretically limitless. You do pay for it, but you can send it to anyone else who has a phone. It is still based, you have to have a phone, a phone number attached to get them, but you can send them to pretty much anybody. And I think um, most people's first social network, if you can call it that, or first kind of IM experience uh, outside of computers was probably SMS. And the, the, the good and the bad, the good is it's really fast, it's effective, um, it's cost efficient now, most people have it for free, and uh, it's immediate, and that's what I love about it, is that I can get a pop-up, it's not going to really take up a lot of time, if I'm dealing with someone, if something has an emergency or asks me to call them, they can tell it to me right away and I can get it onto my uh, watch or my phone and take a peek at it immediately. But that immediacy is the same reason that there's an issue. You can, by mistake, send a text that is meant for your lover to your mom and get yourself into a whole hoop of trouble. And there's really no way to go back and there's fix that. There's no take backs. Besides, you know, apologizing profusely for what you said to your mom. Well, that's the other thing. So, I mean, um, with SMS, there's sort of a couple things there. With SMS came MMS, uh, and you could send pictures and video, and depending on what service you had and what plan you had, uh, audio files. And people started doing this, and whether you were politicians or celebrities or kids in high school, I mean, the people would send things that they probably didn't want to be made public, but the minute these things exist, there's always a potential for them to be made public. Yeah, and then people might be inebriated and have partied too much or severely depressed, and now they're messaging uh, when they shouldn't even be speaking or conscious um, and getting themselves into all kinds of trouble, and people are losing jobs over this. And again, you're incriminating yourself. There's proof of this forever. You know, probably not one of the best methods in order to converse about anything that is sensitive. So... Uh, and, I mean, famously, the, the, the joke was almost that high school kids, probably even younger now, would sleep with their phones under their pillow so they would never miss a text, even if it was 3 o'clock in the morning. They would get, bzzzt, they'd, you know, wake up, text their friends, go back to sleep. I mean, that, that's probably not good for your sleep hygiene either. It's, it's really not good. Plus, you are way too connected to all of the, um, you know, social, great, like everything that's socially happening in between. Um, so that's probably one of the biggest costs. I think that it's an important thing to note that just using a lot of social media, you're also missing out on a whole bunch of the um, social graces that people should be adapting and learning to. You are going to be working in a field where odds are you're going to have personal to personal connections. And if you don't know how to speak properly, how to smile, how to take criticism, how to be yelled at, and um, still, you know, have poise and character with that. You're just missing out on a whole bunch of the basic skills that are going to get you a job later. So, um, what what sort of advice can you give? Let's start with kids. If you if you're a parent and you have kids. Um, and they're texting, and it's all like, oh, no, she didn't. Oh, yes, she did. Uh, how, how do you sort of set li Should you be setting limits for that kind of behavior? I think it's really important to set limits on um, who people have information that they can send to, because also you can have people that will prey upon your children, and it's very anonymous, so they really won't know. And I don't think that young children should be using any type of social media, uh, maybe just... Uh, to their like family members in a group account, that might be one thing. But in the end, I think that it is a really dangerous slippery slope, and a lot of um, you know cyberbullying has been occurring. And you don't want your children to be part of that on either end of the spectrum. Especially, unfortunately, girls are highly prone to the social bullying that they go through, and they will try to destroy each other. So if you can hold off on keeping your children past into their teens 
away from social media. It will be healthier for their well-being, their sanity, and again, anything that's dealing with instant gratification, so similar to video games, you want to kind of hold off on until uh, they're a little bit older and their brains have developed a little bit more. So with that, I mean, that's, I, I don't want to be that jackass who says that's easy to say, that's hard to do, but uh, parents often want to give their kids phones now for safety reasons or even, you know, for GPS reasons. Uh, a lot of their friends are going to have phones and be on, and I don't want to get into Facebook and stuff like that, just keep it to SMS for now because I think people sometimes think that's safer than social networks. That's a lot of both conflicting feelings about the phone for safety versus the potential for abuse and also the peer pressure while everyone else has one. You, you don't want to give in to the peer pressure because a whole bunch of people are doing things that are wrong and it's new. Social media is exceptionally new. We really don't know that much about the cost, what people are dealing with. I see it, unfortunately, way too much. Uh, the bad of it, not really much of the good of it. And so if you can just say, though, everyone else is dealing with it, I will let you have the phone for this, but you are not allowed to do A, B, and C. Like, you can you can call your carrier and have, tell them to turn it off? You can, you can privacy protect. Actually, I, I, I had just uh, called you to say exactly how that, how you can turn off, you know, Facebook and you know other things FaceTime, on your phone, mess, FaceTime, iMessage. yeah, all of these things, so that you don't have to worry about your children being, um, you know, spoken to when you don't think that is appropriate, or during times when you're not able to monitor them. And then again, as we have always said, keep then the tech into an area which is public. So um, you're jumping ahead a little bit on me. <laughs> I Sorry, want to keep it to the different kinds of social networks. Uh, then we graduate from sort of the, the phone-based stuff, and you have instant messaging, which used to be bound to computers, so that, I don't know if it was easier to monitor, but you had to be someone who had a computer and know what ICQ was, or AIM, or, you know, if you're really nerdy IRC, you had to be able to get into those chat rooms, or maybe you got in through video games, because video games often, in, like, especially role-playing games, real-time strategy games, included some type of um, two-way communication system, whether it was chat or with shouts or whatever it was, uh, but that also went to mobile. So now you have things like Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp and Line and WeChat and Viber and Telegraph and the list goes on and on and famously Facebook just bought WhatsApp for 16 billion plus 3 billion dollars. More, more than NASA. What is up with that? Well, but that's WhatsApp? the thing. Is they, it's so so many people. They have a half a billion people using just WhatsApp almost. That yeah. I mean, that that is an incredible swath of humanity using these tools now. And I'm guessing the answer to this is the same as SMS because you know, to if someone just had popped down on Earth, they probably couldn't tell SMS apart from instant messaging anymore, especially like iMessage, which blends the two. Uh, but you know that just makes it even more accessible to people because you don't even need the telephone anymore. You can use it anywhere. You can. You can use it anywhere and I think that I'd like to go a little bit into like just the Facebook and some of the like the problems with oversharing your life with people because I deal a lot with people that like you know they're on Facebook or maybe they're just texting but the problem with Facebook in comparison to other things and and Facebook is amazing you can connect with people and a lot of people that are older use Facebook and they find it comfortable and you can you know share your life but you are watching other people's lives and they put out these pristine happy nice the perfect pictures of what their life is like and so it actually has increased a large amount of people feeling depressed and inadequate and fake and having to do the same thing and so people have been spending an inordinate amount of times looking and staring and sharing at their exes their old families friends families lives and their own lives don't compare because it's fake what you put out there they're all little tiny advertisements of how fabulous my life is and how happy I am and it makes everyone feel a little bit sad and a little bit depressed usually in comparison so there's a huge cost uh, in that so I mean envy stalking um, so to speak envy stalking, so, yes. uh, all right, so, so Twitter we already said evolved from the SMS Facebook was different Facebook was a university thing and they used to have um, whiteboards on people's doors and you would come up and write things on there and you know famously if you watch the movie social network Mark Zuckerberg had an idea for a digital version of that uh, and he built it and because of the way it was constructed you have your wall there where you could write on it and your friends could see it friends of your friends depending on your settings could see it um, and it was a very different construct it started with college students but that it's now spread to almost everybody I think they still have an age policy you have to be 13 maybe 
to get a Facebook account. Um, but they added direct messaging, they added photographs, they added events. Um, and I think that's that's the part you're talking about is that the joke was you'd see everyone's worst pictures, their drunken photos, or that you know, you'd put up a picture of yourself in a bathing suit on vacation and that would get pulled into your boss's contact list the next time he linked to Facebook. Um, <laughs> And Instagram, which Facebook bought, I think, for a billion dollars, that is that exemplified because it's just photographs and people always pick and choose sort of the best photographs to put up on Instagram. So you have that sort of cycle that you were mentioning. Right. And so it's just, you, you just get a little tiny snippet of what someone has chosen to share with you that is, you know, has been edited, has been thought out, has been maybe if you're using Instagram, it's been changed, the colors look a little bit better, you've cropped out like, you know, the little tiny like zip that you had on the side or like maybe even photoshopped it out before you sent the picture. So you're not really getting a full grasp of what other people's lives are like. And I know a lot of people that become obsessed with clicking, finding out and sending things and then you end up becoming friend-mongering, trying to get more and more people because that increases your social status. And then you end up with the oversharing, which I think is really epidemic right now. I don't know. I, I know almost what everyone has had for breakfast, um, where they're going, what show they're seeing, pictures of the show, pictures of the seat, pictures of the tickets, pictures of the friends, and it almost becomes a little bit too much. So, I mean, there's there are two extremes, right? Like you have people sharing their most exciting moments and their most debauched moments, but nothing in between. There's no, oh, I'm having boiled vegetables for dinner, or here oh, I am walking into the song. living room. Yeah, yeah the, very, song, the, the mundane doesn't tend to get that much attraction. It's always <laughs> yes. people seem to people like the people like the worst of you most, then they like the best of you, and then they have no interest in the regular <laughs> stuff. Right, and, and there are some good parts as well. So if you are going through, say, you know, a depression or you feel all alone, you can also reach out in a way that is less threatening. And so it can connect people that you wouldn't have a connection with before and empathize, and you can reach people that you wouldn't know, you would have thought that perhaps you are the only person going through something. So in other ways, it's a beautiful manner in which you can connect with other people that are going through something similar and share support and care. But, you know, then you go out into the real world and it is not the same. It has set us up for a set of rules and obligations and expectations that are not the same as real life. And that is salacious when you're online and then, you know, I see so many people and they're all sitting there together eating uh, having a meal and everyone is, you know, taking photos and texting other people that they are not with <laughs> about the meal. And I'm like, you're kind of missing the point. You know, I, I we, we spoke about the, uh, you know, the the uh, Apple commercial that you love about the, like, you know, withdrawn child that makes this beautiful video and pulls everyone together. But I keep on thinking, you know, you're missing, the real life is right in front of you. Live it and enjoy it because if you're doing it through a third source, it is never as good. That's me. That's not new to social networking. There were jokes ten years ago or twenty years ago about the father never being in any of the photos because he was always the one taking them, or not watching the the recital because he was so busy trying to videotape the recital. Yeah, but it's not the same. It's not as easy. The cameras would die out. The pictures were done in a second. The videotapes had to be charged and stuck on a connector. Now we have phones. We have access almost all the time. How many people, like how far away right now is your phone from you? It's in my pocket. It's in your pocket. It's on you. It is physically Where's actually your phone, attached Georgia? to you. Okay, I will, I will, I will, uh, one second here. You will not lie. I will not lie. My phone is right there. So it's not physically attached to me. Let me try to put this back up. Well, you probably up. have no pockets, though. In my I defense. don't. <laughs> you are so right. That is. <laughs> so I have my phone. It's uh, the cute little 12 South book book. Um, I have my phone. It is always really, really close to me. And so we're always hooked up. Now, I would say that I'm probably one of the minority. It does not ring, beep, um, make any noise, vibrate. It's just is there, but I do get pop-ups from texts, so. So hold on, I want to go back to, um, is, is there, is it just a tool, or is it a bad tool? Is, is the thing itself wrong, or is it a tool that 
that w I don't know how the right way to ask this. Is it just is it a, is using a phone always going to lead you to a slippery slope? Like, is the thing itself bad for us, like a narcotic or or alcohol or you know something that that it, that makes it easier to have poor behavior, or is it something that we bring to it? I mean, there's Facebook, yes, but there's also things like Path, which limit the amount of ten friends you could have. Is that better for you, or is that I mean, is that just a a, a false sort of sense of I, I get I get what you're poorly. saying. No, no, no. I, I totally get what you're saying. You're saying you know you know guns don't kill people. P people kill people. It's not the guns. The guns. Well, yeah, are just is a phone a a, like, so yeah. The difference between a, exactly. a, a a gun and a knife because a knife has another use. Like you can cook dinner with a knife. Is yes. a phone a knife or a gun? <laughs> Neither. There is a difference in between both, and I'm going to tell you what I feel that that is, is that you're getting this instant gratification. You're getting a little tiny shot of dopamine every time someone likes what you put out, anytime someone comments, anytime you get a whole bunch of people retweeting, uh, friending you, taking a Ego look, enjoying it, sharing it, and because of that, and because it is so quick, there is no delay, what we're actually dealing with is we are feeding our need for instant gratification, which is is making us less apt to be able to sit, be paced, and deal with boredom. And life should be dealing with a little bit more boredom. So we end up with these children that are growing into young adults that will one day be taking care of us, that will have no concept of being able to wait to deal with something, to deal with hardship. And the feeling, and I've had this feeling, we, we spoke about it before, about being unconnected, disconnected, it's really disjointing. It has become a part of our anatomy. Is that, that escapism? It's, it's more similar to an addiction when you were talking about video games or gambling. It can become a addiction. I know people that um, it's just, uh, you know, attached to the hip and, you know, you can see, you know, how long is it going to take before someone's going to pull out their phone, check their messages and be, you know, attached to it. You will see people, you know, going through labor, their birth of their first child, which is for many people the most important aspect of their life and they are busy tweeting out, sending messages, getting pictures, which in some ways is beautiful because you'll have a memory of everything but you're kind of missing the point when you, you have, have to a say, record you know but not a memory I'm not exactly I'm not sure how I felt about it let me go back and look instead of actually being there and so we're again feeding a type of instant need which is not great for us as a being because it leads to depression so let me ask you this then yeah I, I like you know people who sit there and Instagram their food rather than talking to people across the dinner table but is that the same thing as people who might be sitting there crushing candy on the sofa rather than talking to people you know, are, are, are all phone you can social be the same is it all the same is it just different expressions of the same core um, is it gratification or ego fulfillment need Absolutely. It is absolutely exactly the same. You could even say that the person that is Instagramming their food might be a little bit better because at least they're doing it with someone else, whereas the person that's crushing candy on the couch, instead of watching the movie together, is doing it all alone and being slightly more antisocial. <laughs> all right, so you told us what to do with kids. I mean, from a, a kid's perspective, you can, you can just not give them a device, not enable uh, things like iMessage or SMS or you know, not let them install Hang you have a lot of controls available to you. What if it's you? What if you're an adult? You're a grown-ass adult, and you feel <laughs> like like you're sitting there talking to somebody, and you're like, this is the most boring thing in the world. I just want to pull my phone out and tweet or crush candy or God, anything but keep talking to a human <laughs> being in front of me. <laughs> you, you first is you have to acknowledge if you have an issue with that. So if you have find you know? it pained, if you find it pain to go through a meal without checking your phone. If you feel that pull to your phone and you need to check it, odds are you have a little bit of an issue with this. If, you know, an hour goes by and you have, you know, if you're on, you know, driving your car and you're at the red light and you're texting, odds are that you should probably put the phone down a little bit and just say, I'm going to wait while I'm driving. And that's the first thing. You really have to check it out. If people if are saying... If you're texting while driving, you might have a problem. Put, put the phone down or like look at me instead of you know what's on there. You want to say, you know what, they might have a point to this. And it, it used to be, you know, again, like you know, a newspaper or a book or you know, you know, something else. So it's not new to us, but it's just so much more salacious, so much more easy. There's so many more things to do. That's an issue. If you're on a date, don't put out, pull out your phone. 
All right, so, all right, so that's exactly what I was going to ask you next. It, sometimes it feels like it's contextual. For example, that old cliche about the parent reading a newspaper and ignoring their family, uh, or coming home and going to the den and ignoring their family. Um, you have friends, you have uh, new new romantic interests, you have people who you absolutely will not ignore. Like You have people that you won't even think about that phone for. And then there's other people, like maybe it's your Aunt Petunia, or, or Uncle Petunia, whatever, I don't want to be gender biased. Uh, and you, like, you, don't, you just don't even want to see them, but it's family, you're obligated, and then the thing, then you really want to escape. I mean, it seems like the intensity of the desire is sometimes not always the object, but the situation that you're in. That you know that that's absolutely true. It'll it'll depend upon the state, but in the end, you want to say what is true to you. Is this actually just the situation, or is this something that you are overly attached to, and then maybe oversharing? Um, you know, sending all kinds of selfies of hundred thousand dealings. Are we dealing with something that's more linked to narcissism, or a lack of self-esteem, um, or feeling wounded and not accepted, or having you know social anxiety, which will it will actually make your social anxiety worse in some ways, in some ways it could make it better. So you can use any tool for good or for bad. The difference between the gun scenario and the phone scenario is get a shot of dopamine every time you get a reward from someone else. But you don't see it as real. And that's the problem. When someone in real life comes up to you and says, you know what, I really love you know, the way that you know, your child was so polite or I love what you're wearing, we get a shot of dopamine and it feels like it's real. Unfortunately, we do not look at social media as something that is truly real, um, something that is kept. And so we get this little tiny shot of dopamine. It does not last for a really long time and then we need our next hit. So that's why it is more addictive in comparison to being out in real life talking to people and being social. And is it something that we should just, you know, uh, like regardless of how boring the situation is, we should, I mean, no, but there are norms of society, like there are, there are traditions of politeness, there are culturally accepted practices, and you should probably, no matter how boring the person is, and I'm terrible at this, I feel like I have zero tolerance for boredom, but you should probably just keep your phone in your pocket no matter how, like it, it, you should be polite, right? You you should. In theory, you should be polite. It's it's very disrespectful to the person that you're with. If you're pulling out your phone, well, especially if they're speaking at the same time and you're like, one second, let me deal with this. It would be much more polite if there's something important that you ask, would it be okay I have something that's important and then take out your phone and then see if you can deal with something. Or even, you know, oh, that's such an important date. Yeah, let's see if I'm, I'm free on the 16th. I'm going to mark it on my calendar with my phone just to make sure that it's there. You you want to be able to deal with boredom and increase your social skills when times are tough. It's Everyone can do it. If you're dealing with someone that you find absolutely fascinating and beautiful and intellectual, it's going to be really easy. It's always going to be more difficult and that's when you need to build up the skill. Going back to something else that you said about the oversharing thing, I mean, there it, when you look at social networks, there are people who seem to have made almost institutions out of themselves by doing selfies, by doing look at me videos. They've got attracted thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers. Um, there are accounts that I don't even know if they're real people, but they have highly attractive people on the male and female, or they're you know professional comedians, maybe under their real name, maybe not, who just say highly salacious, highly provocative things in order. I mean, their their link goes to Favestar. They just want to see how many people favorite and retweet them, uh, or you know, share their links on Facebook or whatever. There is that sort of cult of "look at me" that you see as an example, and you see the reward that they've gotten for it and the attention they've gotten for it. And I can understand how people think that if they overshare, if they put up those selfies, maybe you know, salacious pictures or uh, provocative or outlandish comments, they they think they might get that sort of attention as well. It, it would depend on what your purpose is. So if you are a uh, PR manager, if you are a celebrity, if you're someone that deals with technology, someone that's promoting something, then in that way you can say it's actually good. Oversharing might be exactly what you want. You don't care what the cost is. You just want to get the most attention, the most popularity, and that will equal out to your job and what you should be doing if that's what you want. Um, and there's a whole bunch of people that have, you know, from way over sharing, have become exceptionally famous because of that purposefully. 
um, you know, one person releases a salacious tape, suddenly becomes, you know, multi-famous, and now there's a whole bunch of them out there. People are choosing to publicize, release them all on their own, and going like, ooh, I, I didn't mean to do that when, you know, they have a, a PR manager that's, uh, you know, trying to peddle it to other people. But that's purposeful. We need your sex tape by Tuesday. We have a news cycle to meet. <laughs> And, and I think that it's brilliant. It's it's brilliant. It's smart. It's using social media as it should be done. Uh, if you are a politician, uh, it's m much more important to not overshare. You should be careful what you are sending and in what attire you are sending it in because you might be giving the wrong message compared to what your end goal is. So you should always kind of take a look that this might be forever. This might be your grandma that might be taking a look at it or one day your children. I don't want to see that. And and if your children, you don't have children now, you might have them one day, and it will still be there. Um, I'm sure that some of my kids will look at some of the videos and go, oh, geez, Mom, that was really um, silly the way that you dance. Uh, but you want to make sure that you're comfortable with the amount of sharing that you're dealing with because it's really there forever. I guess in one good way, everyone's doing silly stuff and having them online, and so I guess it'll be like lost in the mix of everything. But you know, then you also end up with people sharing um, private moments that you have that they might be taking with their phone and then publicizing them without your consent. And that's something completely different. So, yeah, so that's the question I was going to ask you. There's a there's one school of thought that says you should, uh, anything that you ever uh, put on a digital device, you should treat as public. Like, you should never assume that anything will be private. Because just like you said, I might send a message to you, but I have no control over who you forward it to. Maybe I'm using Snapchat, and I think, oh, it's going to self-destruct, but they took a photograph of the screen before it did, or it got sent to the wrong person. I mean, is, is that the wise thing to do? Is the, is the proper course of action to realize that nothing that you put in electronic form is going to be private, or potentially will stay private? Unfortunately, you have to. Um, you know, you could even have something on your phone, and it's private, and someone was hacked into your phone, or you know, looked at your phone, opened it up, and sent it to themselves. Or you themselves, lost it, and they found it. Or you lost it, or a hundred different ways that it can be. And so, anything that you put out, even if you think that it's private, might not be. And then, unfortunately, now with technology becoming more and more small, less easily seen. Anything that you really do can be put out there, any private moment. If you are in the car and you think that you are private and, you know, you, you are blowing your nose or even worse picking it, someone might be videotaping you and suddenly you are the next Star Wars kid. So uh, let's say that you know this. Like you, you, Intellectually, you know that nothing is private on your phone. Intellectually, you know that you should be polite to people and not ignore the people in front of you for the device in your hand. But you can't stop yourself. It feels like an addiction to you. It feels like you're oversharing when you may not want to, that you're ignoring people when you may not want to, that you're putting things out there that might end up costing you even though you know you shouldn't. How do you, how do you try to take control of that? What can you do about it? I'll let your battery go dead. That will work. If you are out having a, if you are someone that when they are inebriate, you text and Facebook, one, don't do that. But if that's going to happen, when you go out, don't take your phone. Lock it down in a way that only one person that you know will be able to unlock it for you and you trust them or just leave it out. But what you want to do is you actually want to increase the space of time in between. So you should first start off with turning off all the peeps, the highlights, the beeps, so that you're only going to your phone when you're going to end up wanting to message. Because when you hear the little ding, you want to look. Like your curiosity is like, ah. Oh, I'm going to take a look and just see what that might be about. And then you're not really there in the moment because you're constantly thinking, I wonder what that message was. I wonder if it was Fred. So turn off uh, notifications. Turn off all notifications of all sorts. You should even turn off pop-ups. And then after that, you should just try to see how long can you go without sending a message or taking a look at your phone. If you can go for an hour plus, then you're probably okay. If you cannot then there's definitely a serious issue and you should take a look into it because unfortunately with anything that you're becoming addicted to it usually becomes worse and you might as well stop it earlier than later because it, it only becomes the, the more you end up dealing with the dopamine cycle the more you want to and um, you know something that used to make you feel good now you need much more of that. Is it a real addiction though? Is it something that you might actually need to get professional help with or join a group for uh, or, or treat it the way that you would any classical addiction? 
It, it all depends on you. I, I think that as for anything, like do you get therapy or do you not, it all depends on the way that you work. For some people, like person-to-person -person therapy works really well or group work. And for other people, they can just say, well, I'm just going to stop or I'm going to just curb it down. If it works for you, great. If not, seek higher help. But test it out and see how you can deal with it. And if worse comes to worse, you'd say, well, it's going to be really expensive if I don't stop this on my own. And I won't be able to buy the tech that I would really like to buy. So let's try to curb it down into size. If that's not possible, then yeah, it's a great way. And if you find a match with someone, it does really work effectively. And to your brain, there is no difference. Uh, love addiction, gambling, um, alcohol, drugs, like we're still working with the same type of systems, the reward system in your brain. So in that way, your brain doesn't really know the difference. The effects on it might be different, and some different systems are going to be in play. Now, I don't mean to sound flippant because um, I, I just don't know about this stuff, so I'm, I'm generally interested. Is, is it something like, like, because you mentioned it's like other addictions, is it possible that you, uh, would you have to do an intervention for somebody that you know? Uh, would you ever have to stand up and say, hi, you know, I'm such and such and I'm a textaholic? I don't mean that to sound funny, but I mean, it is, should it be dealt with the same way you would deal with a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction, a sex addiction, a whatever addiction? I, I, I probably feel differently about this, so I apologize if this is a differing opinion than the most, but I don't think that interventions are really highly effective. If the person does not want to change, they're not going to. They have to decide upon that on their own. I think that it is is um, embarrassing, disingenuous, and slightly disrespectful to decide that you are going to do something for someone else because it's more for you usually the reason that you're doing that and you probably do care about them and want to help them and that'll work great if you are a parent and they are your child or um, but besides that someone has to want to change if not your time and energy is wasted and when I'm in therapy with anyone that's there wanting change I will always ask them are you here for you or are you here for someone else and if you're here for someone else it is not gonna work let's wait until you want to change and if you don't then you know deal with what you're dealing with the best way that you uh, want to know how but I, I the, the studies about how interventions work are really kind of sketchy and not great at best. The, the person has to want it. All right, so let's just sort of wrap it up with this. The, what I'm getting out of this, the action items that I'm hearing is that first, make sure your children uh, don't have access to things that they shouldn't, like be age appropriate, don't give them devices and apps and things like that that would cause them problems until they're ready. Uh, right. If you're dealing with... 14 is a great age before they start social media. Like if you just have to say, I'm not sure what age is appropriate, a lot of people ask me. If you can wait off until 14 when their brain is, is more developed than not and they're dealing with like, you know, for us it would be like grade 9. Like y you want to kind of take a look if you can, grade 8, grade 9, so around that many people start after in high school which is okay too but you really want you don't want to have your child in elementary school with their phone or tech it's just way too young for them and for uh, adults social networks like any sort of socialization is normal but if you start to feel like you're perhaps being rude uh, or you're you know it's it's your 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 What's the right way to say this? You're engaging in behavior that you yourself think is inappropriate, then you might want to start taking steps to limit or at least space out your interactions. Right. If you see that every time you get off of Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Vine, you are angry or frustrated or feeling depressed, that's a great sign that this is not good for you. There's that other famous cartoon where the wife is in bed and the husband's at the computer. She's saying, honey, honey, come to bed. And he's saying, I can't. Someone on the internet is wrong. <laughs> I like that, yeah. Often, often. <laughs> All right. So anything else we should take away from this, George? Any, any homework, any recommendations? Uh, use the internet for good, not for evil. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just, just monitor what you do, how you use it, and what effect it has not just on you, but those that are around you. And, um, you know, spend some time to put the tech down and live, live your life. All right, and we can also take from this that there's no, there's no social network that is that is in and of itself more meritorious than something else. There's no point in switching networks because oh, this one only lets me have so many friends, or oh, this one uh, limits the amount of characters I type, or oh, this one uh, doesn't have the same distribution model. Yeah, if you're enjoying it, if you're using it appropriately, if it's not going to get you into a whole bunch of trouble, enjoy, have fun, and you know, just monitor. All right, and if people do need help, they can go and get help, right? Exactly. All right, and it perfect. Works.
Georgia, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on imore.com and of course on Twitter, Georgia underscore Dow. So you're on the social networks. I am on the social networks. I was slightly forced into them at the beginning, but I, I do enjoy them. They're kind of fun. It's nice to see what people are talking about and why and um, all of the different things that are happening with them. So, yeah. All right. And you can find me at Renee Ritchie. Um, just, we mentioned this at the beginning. I never went over it, but my personal social media thing is I mostly use Twitter because it's like the water cooler for me. It's something that I can do chit-chat on with people who are mostly into the same things that I am. Uh, in between work. So it's like going to the water cooler at an office. I don't work in an office, so it serves that purpose. Facebook, uh, I used to accept anybody on Facebook, but I would get a lot of spam. Like, I would accept a friend, and they would immediately start, like, please send me a free iPhone. And, you know, I just couldn't deal with that. <laughs> so I unfriended everyone that I didn't know in real life, um, pretty much, uh, or were, like, friends of a friend. Like, I had to actually have a, a knowledge of them, and that's been much better. Uh, and the primary reason I use Facebook is so that relatives know that I'm alive and what I'm basically doing without us having to talk to each other. That is that is brilliantly funny. And uh, I love, that is something that's really good about social media is that now people have direct access to celebrities. You don't need to have PR people. Like, it really does give a nice direct, direct con contact. Um, often we have tried to, like, email or send regular snail mail to a company and they do not reply. And then one message on Twitter and suddenly, you know, six seconds like letter they said, oh, I'm so sorry. I can't believe Our that you're unhappy cares. with that. We really do care about you. Please stop talking poorly about us to your 300,000 friends. Um, so Google Plus I kind of use because I have to. Well, first it lets me know what all my Android and Google friends are doing. But yeah. also Google makes it uh, tough on bloggers not to use it because you don't get the same sort of treatment on search engines if you don't use it, which I think is kind of shady, but they're Google, so you know what can you really do? <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I'm true, not happy about true. it, but I feel it's like I, have sort of, yeah, I just feel like I'm sort of forced into it, and they want to grow their business versus Facebook, and they're allowed to do it, so if, you know, take advantage of what you can do, but I'm kind of resentful. Uh, and I don't really use anything else. I mean, I have an app.net account, but it's just one more thing. I have a pass account, but it's one more thing. I do use Instagram because I take those photos of food, and then I share it to other social networks if I have to. Um, and I have, like, every instant messaging client because I look at them when they come out. So I have, like, the WhatsApps and the lines and the telegraphs and stuff like that. But I don't use them very much because most people just iMessage me because most of my friends uh, and family use Apple devices. Can, can I ask you a question, Renee? Sure. What do you think, where do you think social networking is going, and what will be the next best thing, do you think, in social networking? Um, I don't know exactly where they're going. Um, I think that the evolution is... So, I mean, obviously, they're hugely valuable uh, because of the acquisitions that are going on and because attention has proven to be valuable. I mean, Google and Facebook both make billions and billions of dollars off attention uh, and WhatsApp and all these companies. Um, and I think it fulfills a need. Uh, you know, mobile is really born from communications. They had pagers, they had phones, then they had f email on phones, then BBM on phones, and other instant messaging on phones. And I think they're a natural mix. Twitter really came into its own because of mobile uh, phones. Uh, so I think that is just one of the, maybe the core service of the the, the phone-based digital era. Uh, and where they're going seems highly fragmented. Like you, I would have said, you know, maybe there could be a winner, but you know, Line is hugely popular in Japan um, and maybe Korea, I'm not sure. WeChat's hugely popular in China. WhatsApp in a lot of European and Eastern European countries. Facebook in North America. Uh, Twitter in a different sort of a context. So I think, you know, new services will replace old ones because it seems like social migrates more than everything else. People were on Friendster, then they were on MySpace, then they were on Facebook. Now they're on WhatsApp. Uh, so I think that'll continue. But I think it'll always just be you kind of go where your friends are, you go to what gives you the best experience, um, and that's still evolving. We don't kind of know what it is yet. Cool. What about you, George? I think you're pretty much constrained to Twitter and Instagram. And Instagram uh, you barely yeah, use. Yeah. I, I don't like change. I don't like anything that has a huge learning curve for me to be able to use it. I want something that's more effortless and is not too complex, and I, I don't feel frustrated. I have a busy day, so anything that takes a huge learning curve for me to get involved in. And I am... I really don't like anything that is forcing me to uh, divulge all kinds of personal information about me. I would, will not even play a game uh, that is asking me to give up all of my privacy rights in order to use it. So for me, I think that I'm a little bit different than everyone else. I, I want something that is 
uh, as free as possible, as effortless to use, and that will give me the most amount of, you know, being able to see what everyone else is talking about and dealing with it. But I think that most of the time I would just be fine um, just chilling out and, and talking to people that I'm connected to. I, I really do like Twitter, though, I have to say. It's, it's nice, it's quick, it's easy, you can have a little laugh and then close it up and not have to worry about any cost to that. So if I were to sort of do the same thing with you, you tend to use Twitter to share new, like at least because I follow you on Twitter, you tend to share news that you find interesting, like scientific stuff or tech stuff, uh, and you respond to people who ask you questions about this show or about your writing and things, um, yeah. and you use iMessage to communicate with your friends and family, probably just because it's built into your, for the same reason I do, that most of your friends and family use iPhones. Yeah, it's easy, and I can also, I, I will reply, yeah, texting I'll, I'll do for uh, my clients because it's quick, it's easy, it's effortless, and it's immediate, and then, you know, for Twitter, I can just talk to people if they're talking about the show, I think that it's really, I try to reply to everyone that sends me a message because if you will spend the time to send me the message, um, you know, I, I think that it's only deserving that I would spend the time to reply back, of course, I don't have that many followers, so it's easy to do. But I, I like that. I like that we can have a direct connection. You can say, you know what, you really shouldn't have done X, Y, or Z, or I think this is better, and and we can have a dialogue about that. So I love that you can actually have personal personal connections that come straight to me. Um, you know, it's it's a neat perspective that you get to take. And what's interesting to me is that when you get a lot, like I try to reply to everybody too because I feel exactly the same way you do, that they took the time to write. I should take the time to respond. Uh, but it's not always possible. And sometimes people get really mad and you don't answer them. Like I, I might be away for six hours and come back and find eight tweets. Why aren't you answering me? Well, you see, I, I, I actually, I would feel the same way. I was always the person that was like picked last and not the person on the dodgeball team. So I feel for people that would be, I would feel hurt myself if I write to someone and they don't reply back. I do feel a little bit hurt. Maybe I'm overly sensitive to that, but I'm like, oh, that's really not cool. Like, why wouldn't they reply to that? And then I'll be like, ah, oh, have they replied back? Like, I will do that. I'll go like, have they actually, are they online? I'm like, they have sent 16 messages. They chose not to see me. Unfortunately, when you get a whole bunch of messages, you might just have missed. Sometimes I'll miss one. I'll be like, oh, I'll go back and I'll reply later to something. Uh, but they might have just missed it. You want to give people the benefit of the doubt, especially on social media, and especially if it's someone that's, you know, has you know, uh, five hundred thousand followers. They might be getting, you know, if President Obama has not gotten back to you. Or, or I think the Gaga. Maybe I don't know if they, he uses his. He actually tweets on his own. I would assume he has like ten people that tweet for him. The Office of Presidential Tweeting. Yeah, and they, they, he probably has a whole bunch of people that do that for him. But a lot of a lot of celebrities do tweet back, and it's just probably way overwhelming. So that's why I don't follow any celebrities really. No, I don't either. No, I like I like I liked that it's about you know people that are dealing with it though. Some of the celebrities are are absolutely hilarious and give great. Uh, interesting info and you can find out what's happening to their day-to-day -day life so I completely understand why people would. Alright, so on that note I'll just remind everybody that they can follow Georgia at Georgia underscore Dow and she will try to reply back to you. I reply and back, say hi. <laughs> you can follow me at Renee Richie and I'll try to reply back to you. And yeah, everybody will be happy. good. You can reply to both of us, follow us both <laughs> and we will both reply back to you. Oh, I'll talk about a disincentive. <laughs> Thank you so much, Georgia. Thank you, Renee.